It's been a tumultuous time for Everton Football Club in recent years. Overextending in the transfer market not only led them to a points deduction and the threat of relegation to the championship, but it's also left them with a squad filled to the brim with overpaid and overrated players. Not only that, but the prospect of a takeover has been lingering for some time, leaving fans uncertain about the future of their club. Fortunately, that takeover is now complete. Farhad Mashiri is out and the multi-club firm 77 Partners are in. The takeover was delayed as the prospective new owners wanted confirmation that Everton would remain a Premier League club, but Sean Dyche has managed to do just enough to keep Everton in the top flight by the skin of their teeth. However, with new owners comes a new vision. A vision of success, a vision of prosperity, a vision for the future. Everton's core DNA has been eroded and it's up to the new owners to rebuild this club and establish a new core DNA moving forward. Now, Sean Dyche fulfilled his role by keeping Everton in the Premier League, but he's not the man to oversee a rebuild. So, first order of business for 7-7 Partners was to relieve Sean Dyche of his duties. Second order of business was to appoint the man to lead Everton into a new era, and that man is Graham Potter. After emerging as a shrewd tactician at Swansea, and subsequently laying the foundations for Brighton's continued success under De Zerbe, Potter would have overseen a similar project at Chelsea, but the rug was pulled from under him. But one man's loss is another man's gain, and 7-7 partners are willing to give Potter the time he needs to rebuild this Everton club from the ground up. This is episode one of the realistic takeover rebuild with Everton, so let's get into it. If you've been watching this channel for some time, you'll know what to expect from a series of this kind. However, if you're new to the channel, we keep things as realistic as possible here, which means featuring a full game each episode, playing 10 minute halves, playing with full manual controls and using my realistic slider set. However, for this particular series, we're going to be adding an extra layer of realism in the form of Buzzco's core DNA mod. Now I'm playing on Xbox, so this isn't a mod in the traditional sense. I've put all the relevant links in the description, but this core DNA system is essentially a companion app that we'll be using alongside the career mode save to add some additional depth and immersion, as well as adding some extra challenges off the pitch. The core DNA system itself is basically a skill tree. There are seven areas of Everton Football Club for us to oversee. Culture, operations, recruitment, employment, development, networking and academy. At the beginning of the save, we'll be given a number of DNA points based on a range of factors including the size of our club, the popularity of the league we're in, and our market size, and we can invest those points in those seven different areas. Investing points grows and improves that particular area of the club, and unlocks certain traits that grant us permission to do various things in the game. For example, if we invest in the first tier of networking, we unlock the ability to hire an additional Global Transfer Network Scout, as well as an additional region that we can send that scout to. However, spending DNA points only unlocks the opportunity to expand our network. In order to obtain that expanded network trait, we also have to invest a trait point. As we play and progress through the save, we'll earn more and more DNA and trait points, allowing us to invest in the areas that we want to improve the most and allowing us to really shape and mold the future of Everton Football Club. As well as the core DNA skill tree, we also get access to realism calculators for things like transfers and wages, which will help us keep all of our budgets and transactions as realistic as possible too. They'll basically tell us whether we're allowed to sign a player, whether we're forced to sell a player, and how much we can offer players in terms of wages, signing bonuses, and the like. It's also going to help us to make sure that we stay compliant with certain financial fair play uh, rules and restrictions. So before we get into breaking down the squad, I'm going to get things set up here on the Core DNA app and set out the vision for Graham Potter and Everton Football Club moving forward. So based on the factors that we discussed earlier, we were initially given 35 DNA points and 19 trait points, and this is how I've allocated them. Firstly, I've put six points into culture, making us a three-star club in that area, and each DNA point we invest into culture gives us an additional trait point to invest in unlocking abilities. I've invested three of those points here, so we're getting a boost to our ticket income via the fan base trait, and we've boosted our ability to sign young talent by unlocking philosophy and market focus. 
I've invested eight points into operations, and each point there gives us an additional 2% towards our starting budget each year. We're also able to sign with two sponsors rather than just one with the ad spam trait, and we're also getting additional revenue from those sponsors with the commercial deals trait. Other traits in this area are also boosting our revenue, and Global Tour lets us play in a preseason tournament. I've maxed out the recruitment tier, making us a five-star club in that area and giving us an additional 5% to our wage budget each season. This tier is massively important because it allows us to unlock Gentleman's Agreement, Intact Core, and One Club Man, each of which are going to allow us to keep our young talent at the club, which is going to be crucial if we're going to build a squad that can achieve sustained success. I haven't put any additional points into employment, but I've put seven into development. This unlocks seven more focused development plans, which will allow our young players to grow into stars. And the future proof and trust the process traits will allow us to get that young, high potential talent through the door nice and early, whilst unlocking practice makes perfect means we can mold those players as we see fit. Now, we'll need a way to find those young wonder kids, so I've put nine points into networking, which unlocks locations that we can scout. And I've also invested seven trait points in, not just to increase the number of scouts that we can hire, but also their star ratings and the regions that they can travel to. We've also hired a club consultant from Germany, which is going to give us a boost when trying to sign players from Bundesliga clubs. And finally, I haven't invested any additional points into the academy, which means during our first season, we'll only be able to have two players in our youth academy and we'll only be able to promote one of them to the first team. So the vision for the club really is to leverage the massive network the new owners have brought with them, including their ties to the USA and Germany, as well as other clubs in their portfolio. And we'll use that network to unearth the most exciting young talent in the world, bring them to Everton and build the future of the club around them. Fortunately, 7-7 partners seem fairly reasonable in their expectations for year one of this rebuild. Their highest priorities are to expand Everton's financial freedom and flexibility by clearing the books of those bloated contracts and then to continue growing the Everton brand. They're setting us a low bar in the league and will be happy enough with a mid-table finish and a decent cup run. And although our youth department is going to be small, they do want to see us unearth some homegrown talent that can break into the first team within a couple of seasons. Now, looking at the squad, it's clear we need a massive overhaul. If we sort by wages, we can see we've got a number of players on big contracts who just aren't going to play a role for us going forward. However, a number of those players do have expiring contracts. So players like Ashley Young, Seamus Coleman, Deli Ali, Idrissa Gay, Andre Gomez aren't guaranteed to be in the Everton squad in real life in 2024 and that is when we are beginning this rebuild. So let me know in the comments below if there are any players on expiring contracts here who you think that we should hang on to. If not I will be releasing those players and starting the season without their contracts on the books. In terms of players I'm desperate to keep at the club I can probably count them on one hand. Pickford isn't young but he is Everton through and through so I'd like him to stick around and we do need some experience in the side. So the likes of James Tarkovsky and Abdoulaye Decore are going to form part of our core leadership. But in terms of key young players to build around, it's really just Branthway, Onana and James Garner. We can maybe throw Jack Harrison into that mix as well, but he is 26 years old. He is only on loan from Leeds at the moment. It does seem as if Jack Harrison wants to make that deal permanent. So again, let me know in the comments below, should we spend some money on bringing Jack Harrison to Everton permanently. The one club man trait gives us the ability to keep hold of two players for the entire career mode. And I think it's those three players that I would primarily be looking to use this trait on if we were to use it on a player who is already in the Everton squad. Beyond that, I think everyone is up for grabs. I like McNeil and Mikalenko, but I think we need to be aiming for a higher caliber of player. And Beto is a fine striker for now, but I think we will need an upgrade as we head into Season 2. So here are all the players that I currently have transfer listed, and there is one in particular that we're going to need to talk about. Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Everton fans might hate me for this, and I wouldn't blame you if you turn the video off right now, but I am going to sell him. It's just time to move on. Calvert-Lewin showed so much promise, but he's been off the pitch with injuries. His form has suffered as a result, and it's just the right moment to give him an opportunity to revive his career elsewhere. I just feel like Ollie Watkins has 
become the player that Calvert-Lewin was destined to be. And I think it's just best for all parties to cut ties. So again, let me know in the comments if you think we should extend any of these players that have expiring contracts or whether we should just release them. The players that don't have expiring contracts will be on the transfer list to be sold. In particular, let me know what you think about Mason Holgate and Ben Godfrey. Neither have really lived up to expectations as Everton players and I would be more than open to moving on from them. However, they are at least young, 25 and 26, whereas all of the other players on the transfer list here are aging talents, really, with the exception of Dominic Calvert-Lewin. In terms of formation and tactics, I think there's two possible routes that we could go. I think something like this would be the best setup for Everton based on the players that they currently have in their squad. This is roughly the way that they would set up in real life. However, Graham Potter is obviously coming in and taking over, and this isn't really a, a system that he would typically play, traditionally play. Um, Graham Potter, known for his kind of um, flexibility and versatility in terms of his formations and, and tactics, but he's really known for three at the back, kind of a more 3-4-3 three, three, or, or even a 3-4-2-1 kind of style. So we certainly could set up this way, and of course we will be looking to bring players in to fit Graham Potter's preferred style of play, but I think going with a formation like this right out of the gate would set us up with some problems. For example, we don't really have any true wing backs that we could play. We have Patterson, we have Mikalenko, and Mikalenko would be fine as a wing back, but that would mean McNeil would have to push forward into that more attacking kind of um, winger or, or, or centre forward almost role. Whereas McNeil is more of a traditional left midfielder. He's not really a, a forward, a, a modern style winger. Harrison would be fine on the other side, but then again, that would mean we're playing Patterson at right wing back. I would almost prefer McNeil in this wing back role. He is a, a very good defensive midfielder. So I think he would be able to function in, in that left wing back role perfectly fine, especially when he has three centre backs inside him to cover for any defensive mistakes. This shape would also mean there's no real place for Decore, who I think is probably going to be a relatively influential player as one of our only creative midfielders in the squad at the moment. So our other option would be to play some variant of a 4-3-3, a 4-3-3 holding or defend, a 4-2-3-1, a 4-4-1-1, it doesn't really matter, but some variation of that 4-3-3 shape. Um, Godfrey, I would put right back Tarkovsky and Branthwaite at centre-back, Mikolenko at left-back. That allows McNeil to slot into a more traditional, just wide midfield role. Onana and Garner can sit in front of the back line. Harrison on the right would be fine. We've got Decore in the 10 to bring a bit of creativity. And then Beto, I'm absolutely fine with during our first season. So I think this shape fits the players that we have in the squad more comfortably at the moment. But of course, we can bring in players to fit the 3-4-3 the, the three, three shape if that's the way that we want to go. So again, let me know in the comments. 4-3-3, 3-4-3. Should we build towards the players we currently have in the squad? Or should we build towards Graham Potter's more traditional, more um, kind of recognized style of play with that three at the back? Whichever system we choose to play, I think the positions we're primarily interested in in terms of this first window, bringing in first team players, would be right back or right wing back. Another centre back would be certainly useful, potentially even two, especially if we are letting go of Mason Holgate and or Ben Godfrey. And then an attacker midfielder. I think Decore is a good option for this first season, but he is 30 years old. We, we do need to be looking to the future at that position. The squad, however, does need a complete overhaul, so don't be shy about suggesting players in the comments regardless of position. I think a young understudy to Jordan Pickford would make sense. I wouldn't mind bringing in a young winger, and we do need to add some competition to challenge Beto as well. Now, after inputting a few transactions and the core DNA mods doing its thing, we only have about £21.5 million to work with here in this first window can expect that to increase by about 15 to 20 million or so once we've sold everyone that we're looking to move on from but we are also limited to just five permanent transfers per season four of which can be players under 23 years of age we are technically allowed to loan in five players as well but i'm actually going to cap that at two players instead so in this summer window i think we should be aiming to bring in three players on permanent deals 
probably around the eight to 10 million pound mark each, and then bring in one additional player on a loan to buy deal of some kind. Now, in addition to your suggestions, I'm obviously gonna be using the global transfer network to find these players. And because we've invested so many DNA and trait points in networking, we're able to sign five GTN scouts, each of which can be up to four and a half stars. Because of 777 partners ties with other clubs around the world, I'll be sending three of these scouts to Germany, Belgium, and Holland. We have to assign one to England, and I figured I'd send the last scout to the USA, since that's where 777 partners are based, and we can use our ties there to tap a market that continues to grow and produce more and more talent each year. In terms of our youth academy, we're able to hire two four and a half star scouts there too. We can send these scouts out year round, but we have to send them to the region of their nationality. So we're starting with an English scout and a Spanish scout. We're only allowed to sign one player per scouting trip. We can only keep two players in the academy at any one time. And we're only allowed to promote one player to the first team per season. So we're gonna have to be very careful about how we utilize our resources in this area. I'm hoping we can hit on a homegrown wonder kid, but our academy really isn't gonna be our focus. Instead, we're looking to kickstart this rebuild by bringing in young talent from other clubs and relying on our coaching staff to develop them. And finally, I haven't hired any coaches or set up any tactical vision yet. That would depend entirely on the system, the formation, the, the tactics that we choose to employ. And we can start to address that at a later date once our plans have been further finalized. But that'll do it for this initial episode of the Realistic Takeover Rebuild with Everton. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I need some time before the next episode for you to make your suggestions, but they'll be coming fast and furious four times a week from the beginning of the season. There are three things I need your help with in the comments down below. Firstly, which formation, tactics, style of play should we be looking to utilize in this first season? Are there any players on expiring contracts who we need to keep around? And are there any additional players that we should be looking to sell? Players that I put on the transfer list that we should be looking to keep? And then, of course, which players should we be looking to bring in? Young talent, high potential, players who can really take this club forward into a new era. Doesn't hurt to leave a like before you go too. If we get 10 likes and a handful of comments, then I'll bring you the next episode in two days time. If we get 50 likes and a bunch of comments, then I'll bring you episode two tomorrow. But I appreciate you tuning in. Hope to see you in the next one. Take it easy.